Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as we like to say here at Shady Acres Woodshop. Howdy! Today we have white oak. This comes to us from my friend Dennis. Just uh, a few weeks ago I turned a white oak vase from this piece. This is a cutoff that I I cut off of it before I got started on the vase. And the vase turned out really well, even though there was a critter or two in there. I sh probably should have microwaved this first just to ensure any critters might not be living any longer, but I didn't. We're going to go ahead and turn it the way it is. It's going to be an end grain turning with a live edge, and we'll talk about that. The piece is about six to seven inches in diameter. It's kind of an oval. It's about currently about three and a half inches high on this side and about four inches high on this side. But we have a chainsaw whoopsie and we have some wood sealer along this edge. So I'm going to end up cutting off about the bottom half inch of this. This will be the bottom, this will be the top. And my goal is to turn a bowl, a, a typical bowl shape, but leaving the bark around the top edge, maybe, I don't know, half an inch or maybe less than that. So what I'm going to do is drill a hole here in the center for my woodworm screw, get it mounted up on the lathe, and we'll get to turning us a live edge end grain bowl out of this white oak. Now it's not always a good idea to mount a woodworm screw on end grain, so we're going to see if it's a good idea or not. Sometimes it just doesn't want to hold, doesn't want to grip. But this time we're in luck. <laughs> Here I go again with that arm. Okay. I'm satisfied that that'll hold. We're going to be turning at 680 RPM, 5 8 inch bowl gouge, mask and face shield on. We're getting down to where we want to be as far as uh, how thick of an edge of bark near the top. But it's over here it's pretty narrow, just about right. But over here it's quite wide, and here quite wide. That can be okay, but we'll probably go a little bit further. Just sneaking up on it, just about there. Yeah, that might be, that might be okay. I'm not sure about the shape. I'm going to come down here and flatten off the bottom and put a tenon on there. I found a little crack in here so I put some CA in it. It's not bad, I don't think it's going anywhere, but I just wanted to be sure. Uh, I can also pick the speed up now about 1100 RPM. And we'll mark that for a tenon. I don't think we'll need the tailstock anymore. Should have used a little smaller gouge, I guess. So I will. Three eighths inch bowl gouge.
I'm going to raise my tool rest and use this diamond point tool to square up the sides of the tenon. I've been asked a couple of questions lately. It's how, how long are my tenons from, from up there to from where the base is to here? How long is that? Well, it's about three-eighths of an inch. On my jaws, and I'll try and remember to show you this when I turn this around. On my jaws, there's a half an inch from the front of the jaw, which is going to touch inside here, to the back of the jaw. It's about a half an inch. You don't want this, the tenon, to bottom out inside those jaws. You want it to stop short. I hope that makes sense. So on my jaws that I'm using today, it's, that's about three-eighths of an inch. If yours are different, I, I have bigger jaws and sometimes this will be a half an inch long or maybe even longer, three-quarters of an inch, depending on, depends on the size of the piece and the jaws you're using and all that sort of thing. But the main thing is don't let this bottom out in your jaws. The front of the jaws touch here, nothing touches here. Hope that's clear. Okay, we'll move back over here to the side profile and finish it up. Well, in looking at it, I'm actually fairly happy with the, the general shape that I have here, so I'm just gonna shear scrape it. And what that means, I'm not sure everyone knows what shear scraping is. I could use my round nose negative rake scraper, and I might if this doesn't work, but I prefer shear scraping because you can get a sharper edge on a gouge than you can on a scraper. So shear scraping is, you put the gouge on its side and you don't let that top edge touch, but you want it as close as you can get it. Only, the, only this bottom edge is touching. So we don't want this, we want this. And that'll give you, in my opinion, the cleanest scrape. Uh, a round nose scraper is great a lot of times, but it, it depends on the wood and it depends on the particular piece you're working on. And I seem to have better luck with shear scraping, so that's what I'm going to do. I think I'll pick the speed up a little more as well. The faster you can get it, the better it is. Well, I can go faster than that, but that's probably fast enough. About 13, 20. And basically what I'm doing is I'm just cleaning up my cuts, taking out any little grooves, any tool marks, that sort of thing. And it worked. Time for sanding. I'm going to start sanding with my Sando Flex. This is 120 grit. I'm going to sand just the bark and then I'll do 180 grit and I'll stop there. That's as fine as I go on the bark is 180. When I'm done with that I'll switch to my 2 inch sanding disc. This is an 80 grit and work up through 400 grit. I'm going to have the lathe spinning in reverse for that at about 350 RPM. And I'll show you what both of those look like as soon as I get my mask on. I'll do a little bit more of that, but that smooths it out and cleans it up and makes it feel good, but it doesn't really change how it looks. And then the two inch disc at about 350. And then as I finish with each grit, I'll just peel it off, hold it in my hand, and sand inside here. So that's what I'll be doing for a little bit. I'll bring you back and we'll put some sanding sealer on there. See you in a bit. Well, that turned out really nice. Really, really, really smooth. 
as long as I've been doing this and as many of these as I've done, I just, I'm always surprised at how smooth you can get with a good sanding job. This is sanding sealer, shellac based sanding sealer. It's called Zinzer Seal Coat. It comes in a can ready to use. I don't do anything to it. And then I'll use Zinzer Shellac over this seal coat for the final finishes. I'll get the brush out here in a minute. I'll put two coats of this on and then two coats of the shellac which looks exactly like this. No difference at all. So I don't show that part. It's exactly the same. A brush and a rag, that's it. Oh yeah, this is going to be nice. Now I've got some in this little can and I've got my brush and I'm just going to I'm going to brush all the bark and all these little bug holes and tracks and whatnot, which I cleaned out tediously, but I did it. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking this piece. It turned better, it seemed like. It's exactly the same wood, I don't know why, but it seemed like it turned easier than that vase I did out of the same wood. Two, like I said, two coats of this, and then tomorrow morning I'll put on two coats of shellac, and I'll bring you back. We'll turn it around and start working on the inside. That's going to be fun. See you tomorrow. Now I told you I would show you what I was talking about for the length of the tenon. How long it is from here. We'll call that the back of the tenon. To the front of the tenon. Because that's the top of the bowl. This is the front of the jaws. They're going to set in here. Right up against that bottom there. What we don't want to happen is for this surface of the tenon to touch here can't have that. Then then it'll be away from the front of the jaws and it, it, it'll come loose and you won't like it. So from here, what I call the back of the jaws, it's actually I guess the inside of the jaws, to here is a half an inch. So I usually make my tenons about three eighths of an inch from here to here. So you, you have to make space around here for the thickness of this jaw, which is only Looks like three sixteenths of an inch, and my space is bigger. But I, I do this for appearance sake, you know. Now, I have a, a separate problem. I hope we're done with that. I hope everybody understands it. See this little gap right here? I'll open it up so you can see it bigger. See that gap? That's what I use when I'm measuring the depth of a bowl. I can stick my calipers in here, in there, and get inside, inside of this area inside here and I can measure from there to the inside of the bowl wherever I happen to be and that's usually what I'm aiming for is 3 sixteenths to quarter inch something like that. Uh, in this case and I knew it I knew it I've been thinking about it all night in bed I made this a little small it's not too small but it's a little small darn near too small. It's about as close to too small as you can possibly get. And I'll show you why. Again, I want to be able to get my calipers in here in this gap so that I can measure the bowl bottom thickness. Well, when your tenon's too small, like mine, and you tighten up your chuck jaws around that tenon, see that gap closing, 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 that's about as tight as those chuck jaws will go. Now I have to depend on luck, I think. Sure isn't going to be skill. I have to depend on luck that, that those jaws are actually gripping that tenon. The size that I had it just a second ago would have been just about right. You want about maybe a quarter of an inch gap here. A little bit less is okay. These are tight. These are closed. I, if, if it gets loose in here, I can't do anything about it. I can't get it any tighter. That's as tight as they'll go. And that's a little spooky. But it's not the first time I've done it, I can tell you that. We're going to be turning at 1200 RPM, 5 8 inch bowl gouge, mask, and face shield on. I'm sure we don't want the rim that wide. We do not. I'm just seeing if there's anything close, but we got plenty of room here. This is about the closest area right there. 
So we can go another quarter inch or so. See how that looks. Uh, well, there's our close spot. The rest of it's pretty wide, wider than I wanted. But because of that, it's kind of going to have to be that way. I could go a little bit more. I just don't want to lose that bark. Now normally you're turning a side grain bowl. That's what most of us turn most of the time. But this is an end grain bowl, so that's why I'm going from the inside out instead of from the outside in. And it's easier on an end grain bowl to, to do that. I thought maybe if I rounded over this edge at the top here, it would make this thicker part look less thick. And it does. It's not perfect, but it's better than not. And again, it's because of this real thin part right here that I have to do that. Well, because I haven't made a bowl depth gauge, I have to kind of guess here. So I'm looking, I'm seeing about two and an eighth of an inch. Overall, we have three and a quarter, but remember we come up in there three eighths of an inch. So that's two and seven eighths is as far as I could go. That would be, that would be cutting a hole in the bottom. So I can go about a quarter inch deeper. That's it. That's as deep as I'm going. I think I'm going to use my round nose scraper. Yay, we did it. That was a chore. Hard wood. Time for sanding. I'm going to start with my 2 inch disc at 80 grit and I'll work up through 400. I'll have the lathe spinning forward at uh, 350 and I'll alternate between forward and reverse and I'll show you what that looks like as soon as I get my mask on. Ball spinning forward, drill spinning forward. Now in reverse, drill in reverse. And that's not going to take very long. I'll see you back here in a bit and we'll put some sanding sealer on there. See you in a bit. When you're sanding you see lines in the piece and you need to get rid of those lines. And those lines are either raised areas or little dips tool marks generally and that's what that 80 grit is for is to get rid of those tool marks well my scraper did such a great job that I didn't see any tool marks so I'm sanding away you know and and I see a line and I thought well I didn't see that line earlier so I stop it and I feel and I can't feel the line so I'll 
I start up, I start sanding again, and there's the lines still, and you know, I all the way through all the grits, the lines are there, the lines are there, and I'm feeling it, and, and I don't feel any lines, and I don't get it. Well, it's because it's got this Twilight Zone vibe going on, <laughs> just driving me crazy. So this is the same sanding sealer I used on the outside, shellac based sanding sealer. And once again, I'll need the brush to get into these bug holes. But I'll tell you what, this is smooth as can be. Someone's going to enjoy picking this up. So just like on the outside, I'll put two coats of this sanding sealer on here. And just one coat of uh, shellac is what I put on the outside. And that's likely what I'm going to do on the inside. And the reason for that is, I get asked sometimes, what do I do for French polish? Well, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't do French polish. But it kind of tickles me when I get asked that. I like to, uh, I like to feel the grain of the wood. Not that I don't appreciate a good French polish, I do. But it's just not for me, for the work that I do. I, I appreciate the work that other folks put into their pieces until they feel like glass and that's terrific. I, I really appreciate all that hard effort but I don't want to feel glass. I want to feel wood. I want to feel the wood grain and with this oak oh my goodness you can really feel the wood grain. It's such an open grain prominent grain. It's just uh, you, you know you're holding a real piece of wood and that's the joy to me. Okay so I'll get, I'll get uh, two coats of this on. One coat of shellac probably and I'll bring you back here in a bit and we'll take the tenon off. See you in a bit. Before we get started removing this tenon, I want to say a howdy to viewer Dave Sullivan. Dave commented recently that he's watched a lot of my videos for quite a while now. And he wants to know, he had two questions. He wants to know uh, how he can be notified of new videos that I put out. Well, Dave, right by the subscribe button is a, a little bell click on that bell and you'll be notified every time I put out a video. And his second question was about not seeing comments from other viewers and I assume not seeing any replies either, including from me. So he probably thinks that I don't answer his comments. Well, I answer everyone's comment. Uh, it might be a very brief answer. It might be only a smiley or something like that. But you will know that I've read your comment. But in any event, uh, you need to go into your account settings and be sure you have the ability, be sure you've checked the ability, ability to see comments and replies. Otherwise, you just won't. And of course, I replied to him, but I'm afraid he's not going to read that or not be able to read that. So that's why I'm talking to Dave Sullivan here. Dave Sullivan, I hope you heard all that. Hit the rewind button if you didn't hear it again. Okay, I've got a block of wood mounted up in my chuck. It's got a non-slip surface on it. I'm going to place the bowl over that and bring up my tailstock. I still have that center hole there for reference, so I can just drive my live center into that, and that will center it on that block of wood. And I'll bring up my tool rest. Spin the piece up, see if it's running true. I'll just hold my thumbnail against the edge of the tenon and it's very true. I'm going to turn the speed up to about 600 RPM. I'm going to grab a 3 8 inch bowl gouge and commence to removing that tenon. I can see that we have good clearance, but I'll check anyway. I'm checking for the distance between my gouge and this surface right here. Make sure there's a space so that the piece sets on this outer rim rather than on that. Just keep working it away. Now that's pretty small, so I'm going to adjust my tool rest a little bit higher. And I'm going to switch to a 3 8 inch swept back bowl gouge so that I can get in there closer.
Now I'm going to turn the speed down to about 400 RPM. And now about 200 RPM. I'm applying the bevel of the gouge against the bottom of the bowl. Right hand on the gouge, left hand on the switch. And when that little nub stops turning or breaks away because it's end grain, we'll know we're through. Breaks away, I think, or maybe not entirely. No, it's still attached, but there, but it broke in two places. So, I'm going to take this over here to the workbench, chisel that off, sand it up, sign it, get it finished, and I'll be right back. Be sure you stick around at the end of the video so you can see the before and after shot to this piece. If you'd share the video, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Well, here it is. One white oak, live edge bowl, end grain, in the books. And the end grain makes quite a bit of difference, I think. There's the bottom all finished up. Quite a few bug tracks in here, but I think they just add to the interest of the piece. There's a couple around the top edge there as well. But uh, to feel it, 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 like I said, it's very, very smooth. But at the same time, you can feel the annular rings in the piece. You can feel each one of these, even though it's sanded super smooth. If you, if you go between the rings, it's really smooth, and then you can feel the ring, and then you don't feel it anymore. I like the amount of bark that we have left. I like the bug holes. I like that knot right there. I don't see any critters in this one. I don't see any faces. Maybe you do. If you do, let me know. But there it is. I really like it. Thank you so much to Dennis for sending this along for all to enjoy. If you like this video, thumbs up please. I'd sure appreciate it. If you're a subscriber, thank you very kindly. I truly appreciate that. If you're not a subscriber, you might consider becoming one. I put out regular videos about one a week and I'd like to keep in touch. An easy way to subscribe is just click my picture you see there near the end of the video. Your comments are always welcome and I love reading them. So for now, this is Phil. Shady Acres Woodshop, signing off.